Welcome to this organic chemistry question practice session. In this session, we'll be going through question six to 10. So I'll go through the questions and just put them up on the video. So you can look at each of these, pause it, and then attempt the questions on your own before we go through the answers. So here's question six, question seven, question eight, question nine, and finally question 10. Now we'll be going through the answers and explanations. So in question six, it says arginine side chain has a pKa of 12.48. At which pH will greater than 50% of the R groups in a solution of this amino acid be positively charged? So we know that we have an amino acid. Its side chain pKa is 12.48. And then we want more than 50% of the side chain to be positively charged. So for this question, you need to know what pKa means and what a buffer solution is. So a buffer solution is one in which you have some of the acid form of some acid and then also the base form of it. So you have the protonated form and the deprotonated form. So for arginine, its side chain, it has a nitrogen which can be protonated and then have the H and be positively charged or it can be deprotonated. So those are the two ways in which it, it can exist. When it's protonated, that's when it's going to be positively charged. And then we know that its pK is 12.48. So according to the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, you should know that the pK of any acid is the pH at which you have 50-50 of both the acid form and the base form. So both the protonated and the deprotonated form. So we know that at 12.48, we're not gonna have most of it positively charged. We're gonna have 50% positively charged and then 50% negatively charged because we have a one-to-one -one ratio. So we can eliminate option A, which is saying 12.48 because that's when we have 50-50 of each. And we want now more than 50% to be positively charged. If we go above this pK, that means that we're more basic. And so we're moving away from the one-to-one -one ratio and we're moving more now towards the deprotonated form because we're under more basic conditions. So option B, which gives us a greater pH than the pKa, is incorrect because it would give us greater than 50% negatively charged. So in option one, or in option A, we have a one-to-one -one ratio of positive and negative. In option B, we have mostly negatively charged, and then option C is correct. We're below the pK, and we have more than 50% of the R groups now being positively charged because it's a nitrogen. The nitrogen has picked up another hydrogen. It already has three different bonds. It's picked up a hydrogen, now has a fourth bond, and because it's lone pair picked it up, now the nitrogen is positively charged. So it's when it's protonated, the arginine side chain will have a positive charge, and it's going to be protonated when there's more protons around, meaning we have more of an acidic solution. So it's gonna be below the pK. D is incorrect, we do not need more information. We have enough information given in the question stem to answer the question. And so just one more thing to know, at the pK, we have a one-to-one -one ratio. Usually when we have one plus of the pK, then that's when we have mainly the deprotonated form. When we're one below the pK, meaning when we're at 11.48, that's when we have mainly the protonated form. So depending on which way you go, when you're one removed, then you mainly have just one form of the species present instead of having a significant amount of both the protonated and deprotonated. But for this question, we just need more than 50% of something. So you really just need to be below 12.48 to have more than 50% positively charged. So C is correct for question six. In question seven, we're asked which of the following is true regarding the product of the reaction between acetic acid and SOCl2. So we're talking about the product of this reaction. So acetic acid, you should know, is a common organic chemistry reagent. It looks like this. It's a carboxylic acid with two carbons. And when we reacted with SOCl2, you should know that the product is conversion of the OH group to a Cl group. So now what we have, our main product, is going to be this acid chloride. So the main thing that changed 
is the group over here on the carbonyl changed. So we went from a carboxylic acid to one of the carboxylic acid derivatives. So we changed from an OH to a CL, but both of them are carbonyls. So which of the following is true? The main thing that's gonna change with regards to this question is the properties of a solution. So the intermolecular attractions, which means the melting point or the boiling point as well. Those two are going to be affected. In this case, we're gonna be talking about the boiling point. And you can see with the carboxylic acid on the left, on the reactant side, it has an OH group, which is able to undergo hydrogen bonding. So because we have a very polar group and then hydrogen bonding happening, because of the hydrogen bonding network, we're gonna have a pretty high or relatively high boiling point for this molecule. It's relatively high relative to the other molecule, which is the acid chloride. Because the acid chloride is not able to hydrogen bond, it's gonna have a lower boiling point. So that's the main way in which they're gonna differ in regards to this question. So A is saying that the product will have a lower boiling point than acetic acid. That would be incorrect. We're asked for which of the following is true. A is incorrect, it's something which is false. The product won't have a lower boiling point. Oh, hold on. It's saying the product will have a, I read that incorrectly. The product will have a lower boiling point than acetic acid, that is correct. If it said the product will have a higher boiling point than acetic acid, that would be incorrect. So between the two, this one has the greater boiling point. Once again, we said because of the hydrogen bonding. So because acetic acid has hydrogen bonding, it's gonna have the higher boiling point. And then the product, because it lost the hydrogen bonding, it's going to have a lower boiling point than acetic acid. So yes, A would be correct for this. B is saying the product will form hydrogen bonds. That's incorrect. It can't because it doesn't have hydrogens that are able to hydrogen bond. So hydrogens need to be attached to something that's electronegative. So nitrogen, oxygen, or fluoride, but there are no hydrogens like that in the product. So it can't hydrogen bond. C is saying the product will lose its carbonyl group. That's incorrect. The carbonyl group is this group over here the double bond between the carbon and the oxygen, but they both are carbonyl, so they both have that group. So that's incorrect. And then D is saying the product and acetic acid cannot be separated using distillation. So distillation is when we separate things due to their boiling point. So distillation is talking about separation due to boiling point. And we just said in A, one thing that's gonna change is the boiling point between the two compounds. And so if there is a change in the boiling points, we can assume that it is significant enough that we can separate them due to distillation. So A would be correct here because the product does have a lower boiling point than the reactant, which is acetic acid. Now in question eight, it says a solution of the compound over here given will have which of the following intermolecular forces. So in this compound, we can see right here that we have a carbon chloride bond that means that we have a dipole. So we're gonna see dipole-dipole interactions. We also have a carbon-oxygen bond, which is also dipole. And then since we have this oxygen-hydrogen bond, we are going to see hydrogen bonding occurring. So just looking at the structure or the given formula for this compound, you should be able to see that immediately. So when I have a carbon with an electronegative element, then it's going to be a dipole. And then if I have an OH group like that, so a hydrogen with either an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluoride, I'm going to see hydrogen bonding. So one is incorrect. We see hydrogen bonding. Two is also correct. We see dipole-dipole interactions. And when you see hydrogen bonding, you also almost always see dipole-dipole because -dipole, hydrogen bonding is a type of dipole-dipole interaction. We also see London dispersion forces. These are just van der Waals forces, and that occurs for every compound. This is just due to distributions of positive and negative charges. So sl like slight dipoles, which arise in every single molecule. So any molecule, no matter what the structure is, it's gonna have London dispersion forces. So we can always say three is present. So therefore, which ones are present? D is correct. All three of these intermolecular forces are gonna be present in a solution of this compound. In question nine, it says a polar stationary phase is used for thin layer chromatography, so for TLC. Regarding a non-polar non -polar compound, compare the speed of travel in the following solvents from slowest to fastest. So what happens with TLC is down here, we will spot 
something. Our TLC plate is actually made up of some compound. We're told that we have a polar stationary phase, so the TLC is polar. So we took the non-polar compound, spotted it onto the polar TLC plate, and now we're going to run some solvent up this TLC plate. And depending on how our compound, which is non-polar, sticks to either the stationary phase or the mobile phase, which is a solvent that we're running through, depending on which one it sticks to more, it's gonna determine how far up it travels. So we have a non-polar compound. If it sticks more so to the solvent, it's gonna move further up. So we're asked to compare the speed of travel and then from slowest to fastest. So it's gonna travel fastest when it's in a compound which it mixes well with. So which means when the compound is with a solvent that it mixes well with, the solvent should also be non-polar. So the one in which it's going to travel fastest is the one of these three, which is the most non-polar. So diethyl ether looks like this. It's an organic compound and it is polar. It's known to be a polar organic solvent. So it's not going to travel fastest in that. Hexane is just six carbon. So it'll be one, two, three, four, five, six. And then methanol is one carbon with an OH group. So of these, the one which is fastest is going to be the hexane. That one is just carbons and hydrogens. That's the most nonpolar of all of our solvents. So the ones in which the solvent in which a compound travels fastest is going to be hexane. It's going to mix with that really well and then not really stick to the stationary phase and then travel fastest up the TLC plate. The one in which it travels the slowest is going to be the most polar one. And so the slowest one is going to be methanol. Methanol just has that one carbon, and then the, there's a dipole between the carbon and oxygen, so that makes it polar. And additionally, whenever you see hydrogen bonding happening, that's gonna make a compound even more polar. So the most polar one is definitely going to be this methanol. So it's gonna travel slowest in methanol, fastest in hexane, and then the intermediate one is diethyl ether. So we're told to rank it from slowest to fastest. So fastest is going to be two, slowest is going to be three and then intermediate is going to be one so that matches up with option a and the other options are incorrect in question 10 we're asked how many pi bonds does the following compound contain so anytime we have a bond between two atoms it's going to be a sigma bond because this is overlap of those s orbitals and then or the hybridized sp3 orbitals and then whenever we have a double bond that's when we have a pi bond so whenever you think pi bond think additional bonds so we know that a single bond between two carbons is just a sigma and no pi a double bond one of these is a sigma bond due to overlap of the sp2 orbitals and then we have the unhybridized third p orbital those come together the p orbitals in both of the carbons to form the pi bond and then in a triple bond we have one sigma so every bond contains a sigma and then the additional bond gave us one pi and then we have another pi due to that third bond so every additional bond is one pi bond and so we only see additional bonds over here we don't see any other double or triple bonds in the molecule. We just see one triple bond. And then we just said in a triple bond, we see two pi orbitals or pi bonds. So the correct answer for this one is going to be two. And once again, we like to remind you that we have a course up called 30 day MCAT prep course on teachable.com. And in this course, we have lessons but we also go through a lot of questions, just like we've gone through in this video. We go through the questions, break down what the question is asking for you to solve, and then what the correct answer is and why the other answers are incorrect. So if you liked what you saw here, make sure to check out our course. And then if you get this type of thinking down, then you're gonna do really well on the MCAT.